You're listening to the British Baseball Podcast. Hello, baseball family. Matthew here again with a episode of the British Baseball Podcast. It's been a while, but now we are back. And I'm really happy to have alongside me Rose Banji from all things British baseball. You've seen her for London Mets and also from the women's senior national team. Rose, how are you? I'm great, Matt. How are you? I am very good. Thank you very much. I'm really excited to have this conversation. We've been chatting for a while about getting something started and now the perfect time has come along. It's a lovely Friday morning. The rain is wet. The garden is muddy outside here in Manchester and uh, there's no better time to talk than right now. So, Rose, um, let's get into it. Let's start off with a bit about yourself, uh, about your home and family life, and how you got into baseball. When people ask me how I got into baseball, I think what they want to hear is my mum's American, which she is. So my mum's from California and was born in Fresno, raised in Santa Cruz. My dad's British. Um, he grew up on Chetwin Road, so he's super local. So people always think, oh, okay, so your mum got you into it. But it's not really that simple. My little brother and my mum, get really into sitcoms and they watch like every season they'll go through like ER, Seinfeld and Cheers right and one of the main characters of Cheers is an ex-pro baseball player and I think somewhere along the line my little brother was like I want to do that my, my mom had heard there's baseball at Prince Street Park we live around the corner from Prince Street Park and so then he started playing and I was I mean I'm historically I just did ballet I was a ballet dancer for, since I was three um, and that's all I was really interested in, a little bit of netball, but mostly ballet and and gymnastics. So he'd be playing his games and I would be watching and doing handstands and cartwheels and having a lovely old time. And then I think at a certain point, I must have realized I could be doing it and maybe it would be fun. So I, I just gave it a go the next season and I was in at least one age group above him. So it was definitely a different experience because watching him do his like minors or majors or something was it was very friendly and everyone was little and then I got thrown in with these teenagers basically and they were friendly and they were nice but it was definitely a different kettle of fish that I had got myself into thrown in at the deep end and I had to kind of learn really fast I don't think I did learn very fast but I learned <laughs> um a lot and yeah so that's how it started and then I just kept going. That's amazing. How do you think your background in dance helped you in baseball? Do you think there are any benefits? I'm just thinking now, if there's any young women listening to this and think, well, I dance and I'd like to play baseball. Do you think there's any transferable skills? Does your dance background help you at all playing? I definitely think it did kind of, in in many ways, it gave me a head start as opposed to having done, like, if I had done nothing, then dance is better than nothing. But I do remember feeling like, the, the boys on my team seemed to speak this secret language that I didn't know about from having played football and basketball and everything that they seemed to have been doing and learning the ways of moving that I had no clue about. And I remember being very aware of that and feeling like I was left out. But then at the same time, my flexibility has always been better than the guys on my team. Balance is another one that I think has been really good. And I, I actually do remember... Te- uh, at some point, maybe I was about 13, 14, someone said that when I bent to get the ball, to field the ball, I looked like I was doing a plie. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that makes sense because that's how I was taught to bend. So, <laughs> yeah, it made sense to me, but um, I don't think I do that anymore. But I do think, I mean, ballet is one of those things that really gets, gets into you. And I, I did a lot of dance for a long time. And kept it going even after I quit ballet I continued contemporary and modern and we we competed at school I was really proud of that I think it was yeah. really <laughs> useful I think it yeah it really helps you learn how to move but then okay this is one thing I did I did find really interesting is because I think as a dancer you sort of start from the outside in and you say well this is what the move looks like this is what my teacher's doing I'm going to try and look like her look like my make my body make the shapes that she's making so that's how I approached baseball I was like I'm going to make the shapes that these people are making with my body and then I'll be good at baseball and then eventually I realized that it's not really about what you look like when you do it 
it's a lot more about where the ball goes when you throw it or you know how efficiently you you can field it or how well you can hit it which was really like kind of a game changer for me because I thought it was about how it looked and then here's this game that says doesn't matter how you look when you do it it's about how you do it and that's a that's a big shift and I think I found that really empowering because suddenly it didn't really matter um and it was about this external thing so it wasn't me it's the ball <laughs> which I thought was really cool were you I I, I hate this question yeah. and I apologize for it but Ask were it. you were you the only female on the team when you joined the Mets and how difficult was it for you to fit in or was it really welcoming straight off the bat I was not the only woman on the Mets when I started which I think is a big deal at the time I was like yeah of course there's two other girls on the team that makes sense I think I don't know someone might tell me I'm wrong but to my recollection I think I started and Ella Henson was on the team and uh, a girl called Fran I think I was seniors age and they were juniors age but they were there they were around whether or not we were on the same roster for long I don't know fully but we were yeah I could see them they were visible and they were there and I wasn't the only one and I think that must have made made a difference I think I did though I really struggled being the only girl for a long time and it's a hard time to be full stop when you're 15 16 17 it's awful no one likes being that age and being that age and being the only girl the boys were going through their teenage years I was going through my teenage years and we just couldn't meet in the middle there was very little like common ground and I did I definitely did make some great friendships and I'm still close with some of those boys that were on my team but for the most part I was like just wallowing in anxiety and stress and feeling like I'm terrible at this sport and everyone knows I'm bad and I'm you know playing right field and hitting ninth and it's hard because I was terrible I was truly 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 terrible but I still did it (laughs) and it was fun so what kept you going then You know, I don't even know. I think that I've always really liked repetitions and I've always really liked seeing something get better. And I think one difference between ballet and baseball is that you can see more tangibly the difference when you improve. Because in ballet, I wouldn't even look at myself. The room is lined with mirrors, but I wouldn't look. But in baseball, you have to look. You know, if you throw the ball and aren't looking where it's going, you probably haven't thrown it very well so you you can see all this feedback you can hear the feedback from when you do something and I think that that that's kind of addictive is like oh I did that better and you newbie games with baseball are so real the the amount you progress in the first year two years of playing baseball you're never gonna get that much better in that amount of time ever again like after that it's gonna be slower and it's gonna be small things so I think those first two years, that's when you get hooked. You're like, oh, this is amazing. And look how quickly I can get really good at it. And yeah, so I think I think that's it. And then also it's a really complicated game. Mm-hmm. And I feel like uh, once you kind of start understanding it, you're like, oh, this is, this is cool. And there's more to learn. And there's still more to learn. I've been playing for like nine years now and I'm still learning new things. And I'm still like, oh, I didn't know that was a rule. Because at, even at Euros, my coaches were like uh I'm not sure about this rule (laughs) we're all like if you don't know who's gonna know (laughs) and that's just the game you know you could be the most qualified person on earth and you still might not know everything about this game and I think that's what's so magical about it and that's probably what what kept me going and I think I'm just a bit stubborn and I also I'm not sure that I knew I could quit I don't think I know these things right people are like why don't you quit let me tell you When I was first playing, I didn't know I could move out of the box if the ball was going to hit me. (laughs) Sounds like a painful lesson. (laughs) I got hit so much, but my on-base percentage was very high. (laughs) So I thought you were a maniac. Well, I didn't know. Who's going to... I didn't know (laughs) that you could move out the way. So I would just stand there. And I think I made the the pitchers nervous because I was a girl and I 
was definitely not going to be able to hit the ball. So they just kept hitting me and I kept going on base. And I'm not slow. So, you know, it worked out. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think sometimes it's it's a good thing to to not know <laughs> you can move out the way. <laughs> brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you, you mentioned then about the Euros as well. Yeah. Can you tell us about the lead up to the Euros, like how you got selected, the selection process, and then being part of that group that went over to Montpellier? First of all, the team was announced, and that was so exciting. And I think that we just had a team call, and um, Drew said, I don't think any of us really knew this could be a thing until it was a thing. Something like that. I mean, don't quote me. But I didn't think it could be a thing until it was a thing. I was like, why would we have a women's baseball team? Because there's no women playing baseball. Either it was just like me and Laura and Ella and Fran. And that was it, you know, for a long time. And then, obviously, you see women in the club and we're all just kind of playing. So I actually had misunderstood the rules for selection for the GB women's team after it was announced. And I think within a week, maybe, of it being announced, I was like, okay, so clearly I need to play for a women's team in my club. So I was like, we need to start a women's team <laughs> at the Mets. And that was mayhem, just because I had misunderstood the rules. And anyway, it's, that was brilliant. And I love mayhem. I'm so proud of everything that we've made there okay okay i'm getting off off track so gb it's testing days and open tryouts and practices where you're kind of being you know being watched being a little statted i think there was two rounds of official tryouts uh, and then there was an extended roster and then there was a final travel roster and then and off we went happy days but well, since you yeah. touched on it yeah. how do you want to know about the creation of mayhem as I said, I thought you needed to be on a women's team to play on GB Women, which looking back makes no sense because there's no way that every woman baseball player in the country can manage to be in the league or in a league. That was a bit of a silly move on my part. But I thought we needed one. And I was like, well, okay, then let's make one. And I'm not going to lie, I didn't, before that, it didn't even occur to me that we would want one, that, that the club would benefit from a women's team because I don't have a personal need for it if you get what I mean I'm happy to play on mixed teams um, and I've done it for so long that it's like not awful and obviously there's there's issues but it's not to the point where I feel like I need to play away from men but yeah. I've since since creating co-creating mayhem with Amanda Taylor I've realized that there's so many more reasons that you might not want to play with men or that someone might just want to play with women and um and I think really creating it was was this magical thing because it it almost becomes like not about the baseball it's just about seeing each other in one place yeah and um it's less so now that we sort of have one team two teams in one place and they play again because in the first year every team would come to one place and you would just see so many women and I think it was like kind of I don't know I don't want to say transcendent but it was pretty transcendent it was like an amazing thing to look around and see that there's so many people and just like I don't know it's like a monkey brain thing if you don't see it you don't really think that it's real and just yeah seeing each other and talking to each other and teaching each other the way we can play the game that isn't like toxic bullshit is which is fantastic because it is a different game. We are different. Women are not small men, you know, and we bring something different to the game. And whether it's just a sense of fun that's a little different to the men's game, whether it's different decisions being made in the game, I'm sure there's like infinite different small changes that you could possibly trace. Just people are people. You've met one person, you've met one person, you know? So... Yeah, that was uh, the creation of mayhem. And I think I think the women's league is pretty it's been a pretty magical thing in helping other helping these players look around and feel less alone. Yeah, and I'm really proud. Good. Yeah. Good and, and so you should. Yes. Uh, I, I, I like I like now to talk about the, the tournament from from Montpellier as well. Mm. 
how do you feel that you and your personality fit into that side and uh, how did you find yourself who, who did you find yourself naturally vibing with when you got there I think there's a little bit of an advantage when you do an international tournament from having done an international tournament before and so I think that uh, myself Laura Harai uh, Mariana Casal those of us who had done that kind of thing before sort of got into it a little quicker I think because it can be really overwhelming you're around all these other countries loads of people all the time I knew from experience that I get on real well with baseball players wherever they're from especially the Dutch right so my thing the thing I bring (laughs) is a ball I'll bring like a bouncy ball wherever we go (laughs) so we were doing this like parade thing and every team was there and we ended and there's some pictures of this I think and we ended up like around this big great thing this kind of square and I just threw the ball at Dutch girl and she threw it back and 10 minutes later three teams are gathered around this square thing playing this ball game that we had kind of just invented on the spot and and we were kind of we were together then like from that point on I feel the French girls went into it that's fine they were going to win the whole thing. Maybe that's how you win a tournament is not making friends. But if that's how you win a tournament, I don't want to do it. <laughs> Cause <laughs> I love making friends. So in the aim of international relations, you should bring a ball wherever you go. And I think, I don't know. I think that's kind of my way of, of doing things. I think if there's a game to be played, let's play it. Uh, so yeah. And I think that's the kind of presence I, I have in the dugout. I try not to, distract people but it's important to keep the the feeling good so yeah. it was my playlist it was my speaker a lot of the time what's um, on the playlist nine to five by dolly parton classic uh-huh a lot of that a lot of like reggaeton we because it was collaborative it was mine <laughs> but it was collaborative so like 2000s stuff I don't know. I can't divulge too much because it's our secret source. But it's okay. <laughs> so it's not available on Spotify then? It is. You know what? I'll send it to you after the episode. Yes, please. I'd like, to have, a, <laughs> you know, I'd like to have a peek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. Yeah. So I think, and you know, Laura Harai was my roommate and she's just like a blessing. So obviously I think we we learned a lot from each other during that week week and a half I don't know how long we were there and you just be you're around you you know share space with her and you want to be better so that was a real gift to be able to spend time with her and see how she operates and see what she's like in the morning you know she's obsessed with high school musical really yeah I did not know that and now you know every morning if I wanted to get her out of bed if I was like Laura we need to go we need to move I would just (laughs) I would just play some high school musical and she'd be up she'd be singing she'd be dancing and you know off we go so I think yeah that's a real I love learning those kinds of things about your teammates and you yeah. only you you might only get to that point after knowing someone for like 10 years and I've known more for a long time now and I didn't know that high school musical thing until last year but it's yeah those pieces of information like that about people like just such gifts because then you know how to love them better, right? So, oh, it just makes me so happy. I want to know something like that about everyone on the team. Okay, I'm going to write this down. Do it. Okay. I think that's probably one of my favorite answers to any question really? I've ever had. Yeah, because your your face, then we're just talking about those moments. And that's what I like about this is finding yeah. those personal yeah. moments. Yeah. You, you can tell that you had something really really good there now yeah. i only had the pleasure of i've, I've had the pleasure of interviewing laura and yes. she moved to manchester briefly oh. and she came on to manchester training a few times and i played yeah. catch with laura and wow. that was one of my favorite favorite bits and like yeah. i said then i learned a lot about yeah. myself and what i needed to improve on because she was like putting it all out there and was yeah. like i need to have that intensity when i train yes exactly if i want to get better like- i need to take training seriously yeah, I wish I'd know about High School Musical before then. Mm. I missed opportunity. Now you know. 
but yeah yeah she's just very deliberate with what she does and she doesn't half ass things she's no, doing, it, doing it you know and i think that's it's it's a really good thing to see because once you've seen that once you aren't going to go back to half assing anything ever again <laughs> you know because you've seen it and now you know in the back of your mind there's a law of horizon somewhere working harder than you and if, you know if you want to be good then you're going to need to be better than her <laughs> yeah or at least half as good <laughs> she's a benchmark to measure yourself against well Absolutely. not in height because i'm six three and she's not, not quite five yeah. foot <laughs> I'd win that one. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Laura. <laughs> like, let's get let's get back on track. Yeah. So they sound some absolutely amazing memories yeah. from the tournament. What you got any other favorite bits? And uh, also what were some of the worst bits? Losing. <laughs> Losing is not fun. I think that those losses really taught us a lot about what we need to, to be now. And I also think that um once you've experienced a loss like that on the like on the international stage, you know you never want to feel that feeling again. And that's a real great motivator. Yeah. <laughs> I and we we're using that for sure. I mean we don't um yeah, we don't dwell on it. Um, but we all know no one wants to feel like that again. No one wants to lose like that again. So yeah, we're we're fighting. I think in terms of best moments, I mean, I think before one of the games, we were all in this changing room, and I think part of the part of the vibe there was that we were in a changing room. I don't know if you know this, but there are no changing rooms. Of course, you know there are no changing rooms. Changing rooms <laughs> are like that was like gold and it had our name on it. It had our little flag on the door and that was really cool. Anyway, so we were in the changing room and we were blasting nine to five and it was concrete. So there was this crazy echo going on and we were just singing and dancing and we were just all together in this moment and ready to go play a game. And I don't even remember what game it was. I don't remember if we won or if we lost, but I remember that. And I remember feeling like this is something really special that we've got. And I'm going to remember this moment. And we were just, yeah, we were a team. Sometimes it takes a while to become a team. Sometimes it takes until you are there on the ground and then you're a team. And it's it's never, yeah, it's never easy. It's never simple. So, but that was easy and that was simple. Fantastic. Speaking of, of teams, we've, we've touched briefly on the mayhem as well. Mm. Now, on the 24th of June, you shared a post on social media with a, a conversation that took place between two young female athletes and one of them being a young lady on the under 12s mm -hmm. and the other being a young woman that's playing in t-ball yeah. about how they're the only girls in the team and the quote was keep playing baseball more girls will join soon and even if you don't you're better than the boys which I thought was brilliant yeah. how did this conversation affect you and and what made you want to share it it was an interesting situation because I was very aware of the fact that it's not that I was seeing something by chance and I was like a fly on the wall for some beautiful thing it was because I was there and had been talking to the younger girl and then the older girl came in and I had this moment of there's three people in this room right now and they're all girls <laughs> and they're all baseball players and they all know this feeling of wanting to quit and wanting to stop and wanting to just be done with those feelings of not being part of it and not being wanted and not belonging there. And so when I heard this from, from the little one, she was like, boys are neat to me and they say, I'm really small and they say, I look like I'm three years old. She obviously doesn't look like she's three years old. And I was like, what? <laughs> you know, what am I doing it for if she's still feeling that way? And that was actually really hard to hear. And because I think you kind of, you, you want to tell yourself that you're making a difference. But, and I'm sure that, the, you know, I'm sure a difference has been made by us doing what we're doing but yeah it was really hard to hear that and then the older girl walks in 
And I'm like, hey, yeah, look, she wants to quit. She says the, the boys really need her. And and now this, okay, this is the magic, right? The 12 year old has wanted to quit for so long. And she sometimes coaching her was like pulling teeth. And I could say this, she won't be upset if I say this to her face, so it'll be fine. It, it was hard. She would walk off, she would leave, this girl. But she kept coming back, right? So she clearly loved the game and she had this amazing arm. And I think part of the reason actually, it's something I relate to, is because the boys would be like, you throw too hard and it scares me. And I've had that. <laughs> and I would say to her like, look, just have them stand back or something, I don't know. <laughs> but keep throwing hard. Anyway, okay, okay. So her coming in and despite me knowing she often wants to quit, she knows she often wants to quit. And we're all we're all in this room talking to the kid and being like, it gets better. Probably lying through our teeth. It gets better. It gets easier. You should keep doing it. Because she could she should keep doing it. She should keep playing. But I thought that was just the most amazing thing to see was just the three of us in that room telling each other, I see you you see me, we're all doing it, and we're kind of isolated. It's not like we're all on the same team, because obviously one of them's like eight, <laughs> one, of them's 12, one of them's 22. But yeah, it was gorgeous. And I just really wanted to tell people that that had happened, because it couldn't have happened if there was any other situation. It was like the planets had aligned, and we were all in that place at the same time, saying the same thing to each other. And, you know, I hope she hope she keeps playing. Yeah. Yeah. I think we all do. It's the way the games will only grow and, and develop. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah. you touched on some really interesting points there. What what can we do then as, as parents and coaches and players mm. and people involved in baseball clubs to make it more inclusive and not to have young women wanting to not play the sport because of the way that they feel? How can we create a better environment for women to play in? I think... I mean, in some ways it's complicated and then in other ways it's really simple. And I think it's just kind of comes down to the the everyday conversations that you have with the kids, with coaches, with parents that coach. It's like a second wave thing, right? So we're past knowing that girls can play and can be there. And everyone kind of gets that. I don't know if there's anyone still saying, oh, she shouldn't be here. She's so... I don't know. I haven't heard that in a while. Maybe I'm being optimistic. But I think where we're at now is this sense that it's a male space that women are being allowed into. Um, and so sometimes maybe, I mean, you might hear a parent say, oh, you've got to let her in. You've got to let her play. You've got to include her. But I think even in that phrasing, there's this implication that it belongs to the boys it's theirs and they're inviting other people in you know there's an alien in the house and you should give them a cup of tea I think that is something that we should tackle next and I think we can do that by just changing the way we talk about it so if I had a son and he was playing on a team with a girl I don't think I would say oh make sure you feel her make sure you you know include her make sure you make sure she feels included I mean I might because I would want him to but what, you know, what would happen if we said, isn't it great that there's a girl on your team? Or, you know, aren't we lucky? <laughs> aren't we lucky because she's got such a great arm? Aren't we lucky that she can hit the ball so far? Or, you know, things like that. And I think I think that changing that will, will take some time, but it isn't a boys game. It's just a game. So yeah. I think the more we treat it like, of course women are here. Of course they're playing. I think also baseball is quite uniquely tooled to being a mixed sport. People will get mad at me for this, but there's a massive range of body types in the MLB, and that's the top, top, top. Like Altuve and Judge are not built the same, you no. know? So I think you'd have to be a real nincompoop to say that women are all too small too weak, too slow to play baseball. I think that's stupid. And I think it's lazy. Why not? 
Indeed. Do you think it's going to take something like the creation of a, a women's division in Major League Baseball? Or like, like the football clubs over here where they have women's teams. Do you think they need women's teams associated with MLB clubs to maybe create that barrier? Or do you think it should be, women should be in the mix as well, have it uh, co-ed, like you, you were saying before? It's a, it's a difficult thing to, to speak on because it's quite a contentious issue. But in my opinion, I think it should be mixed from the ground up I I haven't seen evidence that it shouldn't be and I think until I see that then I'll be team mixed I think that for me it you'd have to really see a massive massive difference in the women's game or the, the way that women play and the way men play to warrant a separate league Aside from the fact that women are undercoached, underfunded, under supported, obviously the women players in this country are on average worse than the men players in this country. That's just true. But that's not because they can't be as good. It's just because they haven't had any coaching, haven't had any attention, the facilities aren't good. It's built to keep people women out like it just is and if I wasn't like so unbelievably stubborn I would have left I you know like half of the more than half of the fields I play at in my regular season don't have bathrooms so yeah there was well Doris tried to get the the WBUK stamp of approval on on clubs didn't she because I mean Molly's even come out and said that the amount of time has been told to go to the toilet behind the tree yeah, I've had it's, to change a pad in the forest, like in the woods. It's like, unacceptable. Atrocious. Mm. It's ridiculous. There's no reason for that. No. So, I mean, it's like it's it's preventative. It's like these are just straight up barriers. Sometimes I'll be playing a game. The guys on my team are playing a baseball game, and I'm playing on my period. No bathroom. No bin. Someone's just touched me. Someone said something weird. That's five extra layers on my game that everyone else on my team isn't experiencing. Like if my me and my little brother are on it, on the same team, playing the same game. He's playing this. I'm playing this, and that's just ridiculous. Like no wonder we're not as good. No wonder we aren't comparing because it's like a thousand times harder, or at least five. <laughs> you know. Yeah. But anyway. It's like, it's not all doom and gloom. Like, I, I think things are getting better and they're getting better faster. But the more we say these things out loud, the more people are going to realize what needs to change. Yeah. Like, DMing the clubs that might not have bathrooms that I deem acceptable really works. So I did that. And the club was like, oh, yeah, we'll put a bin in. And I was like, great. Yeah, it's it's little change. I mean, when I go climbing, they even have in the bathrooms tampons. In the male bathrooms, just yeah. and the free, just yeah. so, just in case, you yeah. know. And it's that just, makes yeah, because people, I mean, yeah, but why not? It uh, often, I think, inclusion is really small things that make a big difference, you know. It yeah. doesn't always need to be like massive infrastructural change to everything ever, sometimes it's literally just tampons in the bathroom and that makes a massive 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 difference yeah yeah totally well it, it'd be great to look back in this conversation like five years time or a couple of years time and laugh about how ridiculous it was um, we're, we're quite lucky in manchester the facilities we, we share it with an athletics track and there's okay. some really good multi-purpose toilets for both males and females to use oh, cool. the training sessions are, are co-ed it's all inclusive up there, and and we do have a, a female team, and the the baseball teams themselves are mixed. There is a, a mixed team, and then yeah. there's the female team. It's yeah. it I is think good. That's a good way of doing it because then mm-hmm. people have an option. You know, if they yeah. want to play with women, they can play with women. If they want to play mixed, they can play mixed. Choices. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I do feel like this is a conversation that we could have for days yeah. about the the genesis but I, I i want to know more about you as a player as well and a person cool. so talk to me about wanting to play in the european pro leagues 
Who told you this? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I was like, you know what? I was making my coffee downstairs and I was like, okay, how do I put it into words? Okay, number one, should I put it into words that this is something I want to do? Number two, how do I put that? Well, clearly someone has told you what I'm up to and their name might rhyme with Shmora from my. It's me. Wanting to play the European police. I just think, <laughs> why not go as hard as I can and see when they stop me? I don't know. I love baseball. I love playing baseball. And I flew myself out to the European Championship whenever that was, a couple of weeks ago, to help with the social media. And, well, yeah, to help with social media, but mostly just to be there and to see it. And, and I saw these guys playing, and they're amazing, obviously. And then I spoke to them, and they were lovely. And Drew, like, moved me around the field at practice. He was like, Rose, meet Nick Ward. Nick Ward, meet Rose. Rose plays on the GB women's national team. And he was like, great, nice to meet you. And he did this with like basically every player on the team and introduced me like that as well, which I thought, and that's Drew's magic, right? That's how he builds the programs that he builds with, with language and people. Anyway, I could talk about Drew forever. He knows I could talk about him forever. He's great. What am I trying to say? Anyway, so, okay. Then I hung out with them. And I was like, these guys are just people and they're funny and they're smart and they're kind yeah. and they're switched on and they love the game. And I don't know what I thought. I think I maybe thought that people who played at that level were kind of like dull and boring and just single-mindedly athletes, which seems very, I can't believe I thought that. <laughs> that makes no sense. I think also it's, it's partly the Drew Spencer effect that he brings people in who are fantastic people and fantastic ball players. But I also think that being a fantastic baseball player has a lot to do with being a fantastic person. I was like, wow, okay. If they can be funny and professional baseball players, then I want to do it too. <laughs> you know, I thought you had to lose part of yourself to get that far. Turns out you don't. So then I was like, dang, I want to do it. And they were talking about their plans. They were like, oh, I'm going to go play Frankfurt. I'm going to go play in uh, Australia. I'm thinking, oh, I don't know. I'm not sure. Maybe Germany, maybe the Netherlands. I don't know. And I was like, huh, I want to do it. <laughs> so I said, I put out some feelers to people I know and trust and love. I said, who do I have to talk to to make this happen? And they were just very, you know, the response was bountiful, plentiful and enlightening. And it doesn't seem impossible, is what I'll say. <laughs> That's brilliant. Well, now you've got this target. What are you doing to work towards it? Um, I'm just going to have to, like, work my absolute butt off. Going to do training camps. I'm going to the Ebske camp next Wednesday in the Netherlands. And I think the general theme of how I'm going to do it is keep saying it out loud. And so that's one reason I'm glad you brought this up because now I'm talking about it on a podcast. So I think me and Laura have been, have been saying to each other, like, if we don't say these things out loud, no one's going to know that we want to. No one's going to know how to help if you don't even tell them what you're trying to do, much less ask. If I just, you know, just saying it though is, is big. <laughs> and then you can ask people for help and then they can help you. And I think that's another gift that you can give to people is tell them how they can support you. And they want to, people want to help, especially in British baseball, I think, because everyone knows each other and they, they love each other. Yeah. A lot of the people I know in GB have known me since I was 13. That's a long time. And they've seen me grow up and they know what kind of person I am. So I think then if you ask for help, they mean it. 
you know, they're not gonna be like, oh, I don't know, I'll think about it and never get back to you. Like I spoke to Jonathan Cramen and I said, who do you think I should, when do you think I should go to get really, really effing good? <laughs> and he like reads the message, spends a week not replying. And part of me is like, oh my God, this is so embarrassing. I've asked such a silly question. He's not gonna, he's not gonna, t- I don't know, it's really bad. I, I need to rethink my life. When I see him again, he's like, Rose, I have an answer to your question. And then I remember, it's Kramit. He's a thinker. He's been thinking about this for a week. He says, I spoke to this person and this person. We think you should go here. They have everything you need. Tell me when you need a reference. I was like, okay. <laughs> and that's just, that's, that's the magic, I think. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Unlike we were saying before, if you don't ask. Yeah. If you don't ask. You're yeah. definitely not going to get. No, but it's really good that the community, and it's one of the things that I love about the community as well, is that everyone is supportive of each other. But rivalries aside, yeah, people don't want to see others do wrong because people want the best for British baseball and to support yeah. it. And it could be like we were touching on before with, with the women playing. Like I was fortunate enough to have a plethora of players that I could watch and look up to yeah. in any sport. I mean, Ken Griffey Jr. was my guy when I first started watching. Mm-hmm. But you look now, in this country, who can women watch to get inspired? Right. And the, the answer there is they'll all just watch softball. Yeah. So no, but we're talking baseball. Like, who who can they watch? Yeah. So it could be that you become <laughs> a, a lead in the way, you know? And yeah. it could be that exposure and that gets... Because yeah. these kids now that are watching, that are training at the ball clubs are looking up to the other athletes around them instead of on TVs for their inspiration. Right. Yeah. I think as it stands, we have a bit of a drought of women to look up to ourselves. And this is something that, that we've been talking about is just, just be it, you know, just be it. Um, and that's so scary because <laughs> you want to see someone else do it so that you know it can be done. So we're in this position of, I think, almost having to kind of take the uh, take the ego out and just be like, I need to do the thing so that I know it can be done. And that's, that's kind of wild to be it and look at it, if you get what I mean. Because at the moment, we've got Kelsey Whitmore, and that's it. I think <laughs> as far as I know, we've just got Kelsey Whitmore playing pro ball uh, in the US. And let me show you something. So mm. she sends this into our accountability group, which is a small group where we say, oh, I've gone to the gym today. I did legs or whatever. And then the rest of us go, yeah, girl. It's great. I love it so much. This, I don't know if you can read it. This says, I saw Kelsey Whitmore doing explosive eccentric sports squats so i did eccentric <laughs> squats that's literally the perfect example of what we're doing we just look at her and we're like okay dope so i can do it too and i think but like that's one woman and those of us who may or may not be trying to play semi-pro or pro we have to kind of just put that need aside to have someone to look up to you and just do it anyway (laughs) which is crazy but you know why not and I was thinking I'm just why not just even if it doesn't happen I want to see how far I get and then I'll know where it is where the end is so that I can kick it down to the next girl you know yeah Yeah. because you're not gonna know like how are you gonna know where the end of the line is if you're not exactly, looking. exactly. You just gotta keep pushing. Like one of my favorite phrases was like, "Aim for the stars." Yeah. And missing is better than aiming at the floor and hitting it. Yeah. Because if you don't go straight up, you're gonna get there and thereabouts. It's better than being definitely than where you are. Definitely. And like, there's no. I, I was realizing that you kind of emerge into adulthood, and everyone's like, "Well, what do you want to do?" And baseball, I guess. <laughs> you know, and you. I think kind of have this freedom which I love people find really scary and I can see it being paralyzing but I also think it's a real freedom to just be inventive 
and what a brilliant opportunity to invent something. And I think Drew was also saying this, uh, he was saying that the other teams in the GB program aren't ever gonna be able to move the needle as much as this GB women's program is because of where we're at in the journey of things. I think as hard as it is and as challenging as it is, I think taking a big picture view, like this is historic. The things we're doing are big. Yeah. <laughs> and it feels like silly, you know, it feels like every day throwing a weighted ball at the wall or every day going to do BP in the park and dealing with the weird guys that come talk. A 45 year old man came and asked me for my number this week while I was doing BP. So like, I can't go to the park. It's five minutes from my house, less than five minutes from my house. I can't go there, stand in the cricket cage, hit the ball like I need to do to get really effing good without being creeped on. It's these little things that happen and you just kind of have to get through it so that. Yeah, but you shouldn't happen. have to get through oh, it. I That's know. like oh, I'm another so podcast annoyed. altogether about society. And it's why it's me ridiculous. and my wife are trying to raise our lad to be better nice. than that. Yeah. You know, and it's it's going to be hard because you're at school in Salford, but mm. you know, it's like you leading the way there, like trying not to get him to copy behaviors and, and lead the way. Yeah, let, let let his friends copy him in a positive yeah, way. Definitely, yeah, be the change. Yeah, and giving him the courage and confidence to challenge things that it doesn't think are right and yeah. behaviors that it doesn't feel trivial. Yeah, it that's can't be can't be good, especially like you said, you just want to get out there, you just yeah, doing yeah, your you own just thing, and... you're just getting harassed by yeah dirty old men. Yeah, the the mindset is always been like control the controllables, and if you don't have a throwing partner. So do sock throws, do towel throws and things like that. If you don't have a tea, do this and that. And there's all these different things. There's different ways of working around these obstacles. And then I feel like there's obstacles that are just obstacles. Like this dude. Want to, you know, but yeah, I think talking about it is a big step in the right direction. Because yeah. I think also people don't know. No one's going to know that I'm dealing with this unless I say it. Because I think I, I, I assume that everyone's dealing with the same things as me. But if I said to Nick Ward, right, so when's the last time some weird old man came up to you at BP and asked for your number? He would be like, Rose, <laughs> never. <laughs> I think remembering that as normal as it feels to me, it's enraging, but it feels normal at this point. It's not normal and it no. shouldn't be happening. No. So, yeah. yeah. Not a shame. Well, we're not going to end the conversation on that now, no. by a chance. <laughs> but again, I do think it's something that, that needs to be explored further. Yeah. So uh, something that's been been mentioned is uh, your passion. I think anyone that's listened to this conversation so far will will see that coming through. <laughs> so your passion stands out to others when they think of you. What drives and motivates you? And what are you passionate about away from baseball? Well, that's really sweet. <laughs> Very happy to hear that that's how I come across to people. Well, I did the High Performance Academy with Liam Carroll and Will Linton a few years ago now. But I did that for years. And one thing that they said many times was to fall in love with the repetitions. And I think that really shifted things for me and helped me get into the minutia of getting really good. Because you, if you don't like fielding short hops, you will not go anywhere <laughs> if you don't like throwing the ball against the wall a hundred times or if you can't see any kind of beauty in that then you probably won't have that much fun and it'll be a grind like a miserable grind and I think that learning how to take those kind of boring repetitive things and make them into something else I think that's a real a real task and that can translate into anything in life and it's really taught me I think to zoom in and say well I know I have to do this a hundred times but I don't have to do it with my eyes closed you know I don't have to do it with my brain shut off I can do it being present and I can be aware and I can be mindful like mindful reps are so much more valuable than just doing the thing for the sake of doing the thing to like tick it off and say oh it's my uh, I did it I did it coach did my reps because there's doing the reps and then there's doing the reps you know I honestly think that that's been a big, a big game changer for me, just in, in general life, it's learning to zoom in and find 
something to learn from or something beautiful or something that I can then communicate to other people within that. And I think that also translates into the, the other things I'm passionate about. And I, as I've said, I said to you at the start of this, that I um, I'm really into theater and film and art and it, kind of creative media. And I just think that there are so many ways of telling stories that we like we're just kind of blessed with it you know and there's there's so much more to be done there's more than just films and just theater and just paintings and I think that the future of art is blending it all together so I'm in this position of I mean I felt like it was kind of two there was two halves of me right like this artist and then the baseball player and then I'm slowly realizing that it can be it can be one thing right and you can't really be yourself until you marry these different dissonant parts and how sick would it be if I started making films about baseball players or about women baseball players or interviewing people on what what they're up to and and like recording these stories and I think what Andy Brown the painter does amazingly is that he paints live and he's and I've seen him do it now. he stands there and he watches the practice and he's done a painting and that's live art and you know it's live art even though yeah. he ends up you end up with a still painting it's not still, I mean look at his they're not anyway you know what I'm trying to say so I think that's what's really 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 exciting to me about being alive right now being who I am right now and in the place that I'm in right now is that there's so much potential for telling these stories and telling them in a way that hasn't been done before and also doing things that haven't been done before so I mean how could you not be passionate about that exactly <laughs> like yeah it's just the coolest thing ever to be alive right now you should do a podcast I should do a podcast and all the things you talked about <laughs> all right maybe I will there you go. Well, would you I'll be on my podcast? Probably. Would I be on it? No, yeah. I'm boring. No, you're not. That's you're... why I host. Ask the question. I want to know what it's like to do a baseball podcast. What it's like to do a baseball podcast? Yeah. Well, it's fascinating. I get mm. to meet all sorts of different and interesting people from all different walks of life and backgrounds. Yeah. My social group got a lot bigger than I thought it ever would do at the age of forty. Ah. I thought that I was at a point in my life where I just had like eight mates that I was close to yeah. and then this community just opened its arms and yeah. people give me contacts and other people to interview and point me in direction and you know and they you know I'm, I'm talking to hall of famers and national team managers and people I have no right talking <laughs> to because I've been involved in the game for 12 minutes instead <laughs> of it's, yeah. people that are out there doing it but the podcast is very time consuming mm it takes up a lot of time. Like we're lucky that we're doing this on a Friday afternoon, but usually these would be done between the hours of eight o'clock and 10 o'clock at night when my son's asleep and his bedroom mm -hmm. is like there. So mm -hmm. I'm not normally this animated. One of the things I got in a feedback thing was like, needs to be more excited when you talk. It's like, I am excited. Don't get me yeah, wrong. Yeah. But, you know, I've got don't to wake be up really before. quiet because yeah. I don't want to wake up my, like he would have been like four, three, yeah. four, five and six year old. He yeah. needs his sleep. Yeah. And then, you know, I've got to edit, publish it, master it, get it out there into the world. That can take time. That's using my dinners or, yeah. again, after done the interview. So that can take me the full two hours. Right. And, you know, it is very time consuming, mm -hmm. but it's brilliant. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've needed to take the time off to to sort of refresh and, and yeah. get my... Because I, I had doubts. get the mojo like, back. Yeah. Like, I didn't know whether or not I was the right person to be doing this. Oh. Because I'm convinced there's other people better at doing this than me. And the guests will always do. No, they're not. Unfortunately, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I always have that down in the back of my mind that my guests yeah. deserve better. Or, like, if you listen to someone like Back Flipping Nerds or, or Birds with Balls and stuff like the people and they're doing it properly, Jason and, and, and John up in Scotland, I listen to their interviews and it inspires me to do stuff. I'm like, that's how you interview somebody. And then it's me going, and what's your favorite tree? And, <laughs> I have a favorite tree. You want to know about it? Yeah, tell me. <laughs> I really like ginkgos. I actually, I love trees. This is great. See, if you did ask people what their favorite tree was, I'm sure they had something. To, they would have something to say. I love ginkgos. They also called a maidenhair tree, and they're one of the oldest surviving species of plant on Earth. And dinosaurs ate them. And there's like six of them around the corner 
Isn't that wild? That's amazing. Come for the baseball, stay for the tree chat. Exactly. Put that in the tagline. Everyone's going to love it. Oh yeah, yeah. That's that's the, that's going to be my uh, my little segment for the for the yeah. teaser Tree trailer. Talk. Tree talk. Yeah. Trees with rose. Yeah, I want a jingle. Oh, jingles. I want a jingle, Matt. Right, I'll see what I can do. I had a great one <laughs> from Corey. We're talking about baseball and theatre. Corey English, who plays Doc Brown in Back to the Future, the musical yes. part of the Hearts baseball. He recorded me an intro as Doc Brown, and I couldn't get it off my phone, and I was devastated because oh. it is so good and i can't get it out there into the universe without it sounding crap off my off my device that is actually crushing all right yeah <laughs> yeah that that's it but if you if you are going to do a podcast and i would urge anyone out there that's listening or not listening do your own thing do one for your club do one for your team do one for whatever you're passionate about i mean if i wasn't doing this i'd probably be doing it about tabletop gaming or, or something that i'm interested in because it fuels my creativity and my, my thinking and you know, I, I enjoy it, and I do like the the people it's introduced me to, and the yeah. doors that it's opened. I mean, yeah. it's not MLB that lights my fire. It's not the Japanese league that it's yeah. British baseball. It's grassrootsness, yeah. grassrootsness. I I hit, I get it right, yeah. and the people. Yeah. It's magic. I love the people that are involved in this sport. That it's like nothing I've ever played before, and yeah. I've done a lot of different sports like basketball. I was massively into hoops when I was a kid. Ice hockey, yeah. I played at rec level really badly. Yeah. But nothing connects me to it like baseball does and the people, yeah. you know? It's, but, it's not something very, very, very special. And I think, I think you've answered why you're doing it and not someone else. Because who else is going to feel like that about it? That's a you thing. That's why you're doing it. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think- yeah, I I just I just think that the people it just makes me sound like a really Say down it. on myself. But like I, I do think that, that the sport itself and the people involved in it would always benefit from better. And I don't always think that's me, but I think you know, somebody is. better come along and do a British baseball podcast. You, you can have it. I'll even give you my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do well, it forever. If you ever need an intern, let me know. So right, let's move this away from me. Who would make you a Mount Rushmore of British baseball people? Jonathan Crammon, number one. I think he's one of the first people who spoke to me like I was a grown up before I was grown up. And he would like look me in the eye and actually engage with me about what I wanted to do in my life and why I wanted to do these things. And I remember talking to him about, I was about to go to uni, I think, or I was deciding if I wanted to go to uni. And he was just talking to me about it like I had every option in the world. He was like, okay, well, why? Why not? Why, you know, what are the pros and the cons? And and what is it about yourself that makes you think that this is the right move for you? That kind of thing. He wasn't doubting it. He was just interested. And he, I think he wanted me to think about it because he's a thinker. And I think he wants everyone else to think. And I think that's a gift. And I think and he's always like that. And he's he's like that about baseball. And he's like that about life. And that taught me a lot about what kind of person you can be. It's people like him, people like the boys I saw, I guess they're men, <laughs> the players I saw at Euros that make you realise that there's not one way of being and and you can make it your own and you can bring your whole self into it. You don't have to like carve off the pieces that you think don't fit because whatever, like whoever you are, there's going to be there's going to be a use for it you know there's going to be some thing that you can bring that no one else can bring so he taught me that and also he's just a great coach <laughs> and he's good at baseball and he knows baseball so Kramen number one I mean not in order but like you know yeah, yeah. I would say Drew Spencer it's a bit of a cop out I feel like because he's the guy but again he has never been anything other than supportive he's oftentimes he's dreaming bigger than I am which is crazy and it's so it's such a a blessing to have someone like that who's just all guns blazing for success for your success and for the women's game and he sees this massive picture that I can only kind of 
see a corner of and he's got this whole tapestry and I'm here like weaving a tiny little thread but I know that he's got a plan and even if he doesn't have a plan he makes it seem like he's got a plan and that's good enough you know <laughs> so I'd say Drew Spencer for sure Laura Harai she's gonna get mad at me if I say her but I have to say her because she just makes me want to be better in every possible way and it's just such a pleasure to know her. I mean, she's brilliant and everything she touches turns to gold and everyone she meets is just kind of blown away by who she is and how she is and how she does it. And I think that we could all, everyone could use a bit more Laura, Laura in their life. Number four. Hmm. And there's so many people that have taught me so much about flowing. I would say Liam Carroll. And he's off with the what Red Sox? Salem Red Sox. Yeah. And good for him. Yeah. And that man is so difficult and picky and such a harsh taskmaster. And I was training under him when I was too young to want to work that hard, but he made me work that hard. And and I hated it, but I loved it. And there's things that he said to me and they'll never leave my head because he coaches so like succinctly. He says it in the way and not everyone, not every coach works for every player, but that man works for me, he works. And there's things he said about playing infield and like sometimes it will be the most obvious stuff. Like he said, Great infielders make plays. But he'll say it in the moment and in the way that makes it sound like the most monumental thing you've ever had in your life. And you're like, oh my God, you're right. <laughs> and that's just how he is because he's so smart, just like him. He's just like a genius and he knows so much. And somehow he knows the right thing to say at the right moment. And he said, fall in love with the, the repetitions, fall in love with tiny bits of the game. And I think that if if any one piece of advice has helped me to get as far as I've gotten so far, it's that. Because I think if I hadn't been told that, if I hadn't had that in my in the back of my mind all this time, I'd have been like, this sucks. This is boring. I don't understand how I have to do so much off the field to even step on the field with the tiniest bit of confidence. It makes no sense um but it does make sense and that's the beauty of it and it's kind of crazy because it's just a game but it's really cool to get really good at something because you love it and you think it's beautiful and you think it's worth it so thanks Liam Carroll and that's my baseball rush more brilliant <laughs> and you know, to the untrained ear, that might sound like you had loads of time to prepare that as well, but you only found out the question this morning. I did. Yeah. And uh, last one from me. Uh, if you had one wish for British baseball, what would it be? I think bathrooms is a cop-out, so I won't say that. <laughs> one wish for British baseball. I think we need to have more fun. I think we need to have more fun, and I think we need to take it a little easy and be kind and have more socials and I want to have socials with other sports I think that because we're such a small sport we get into this kind of mindset of being the only people on the planet and it's not true people are running sports clubs all over the place and I think if we only ever learn from each other that's such a small pool of information and of character and and culture and there's other sports that maybe they have a really great team culture and we're not learning from them. So I think we need more like inter-sport like partnerships. Maybe yeah. there's an American football team around the corner that you need to, you know, that we could reach out to or a football team or, I don't know, basketball, things like that. I think that would really help us. I think yeah. nothing bad has ever come from making connections. So no. that's my wish. It's funny you should say that because at the end of last season, the Manchester Crows flag football team came to our baseball training session and what they do at the end of each season, as a group, they actually go to different sports clubs and try out different sports. Oh. And so they've done like volleyball. I think they said they've done volleyball. 
and field hockey, I think. Mm. And that, uh, and then he came across baseball. Wow. And it wasn't so after chatting with them, and um, being an NFL fan as well, I went down to one of their training sessions. Yeah. And then when I was had finished, I was there pretty much throughout winter. I went to like six or seven flag football training sessions and I've stayed in touch with them and I've been to some of the tournaments and they have, do you know what, it's not even enough. It was in Manchester, they had the playoffs and they had teams from London, Scotland. It was packed. You couldn't wow. move for, yeah. like the car park was full, the wow. cars in the streets, they had like a fan zone with little shops and eating stores and stuff and this was flag football and I was like yeah. I'd, I'd only just stumbled across it and it, yeah. like we said before if you don't know you don't know yeah. but like this whole community yeah. out there that is swelling and massive and, and it's just there's so much there and I was just thinking like I'd love to see baseball like this yeah like yeah. Manchester has I think four clubs flag mm-hmm. football teams within it five miles That's of each crazy. other and they had like their own little tournament set up and I was like yeah. Why yeah. can't we? Yeah, well, I think we're on building for that. You know who likes sports? Sports fans. You know who will like baseball? Sports fans. <laughs> and I think that the, you know we already have so much in common. So yeah, Rose. That brings us to the end of yeah. our conversation. And as always, the floor is open to you. Have you got any parting words or any advice? Any shout outs you want to give? Shout out to the women's team. Shout out to the little girls. Yeah, and. uh yeah, just thanks. Thanks for having me. And I expect an email about being the intern within the day. Thank you. I've already, I've already drafted it up. Great. When you're talking. Good. Great. <laughs> Rose, yeah. you've been fantastic. Thank you so much. And I'm sure the listeners will agree you've been a fantastic guest. Enjoy yeah. the rest of your day and I'll chat to you soon. You as well. Take care.